Get on your tiptoes, I'd tell myself. Stand up taller. Lower your squeaky voice. These were some of the thoughts that raced through my head every time I stepped foot into my research lab. At age 11, I was always preoccupied over the little things, like keeping my algebra notebook shut so no one could tell that I was a middle schooler working alongside PhD students. And in my experience up to that point, age had always been a limitation. Now, I'm a 14-year-old, developing a detection method for tumor spheroids in cancer diagnostics. Or at least I'm trying. But most wouldn't expect anyone like me to find a cure to cancer or a solution to global warming. But I'm trying, and I shouldn't be an anomaly. Because, unfortunately, I don't think most preteens can say they've felt that encapsulating feeling where you press your eye up against a microscope just to find that fluorescent green stain you've been working months to find. Because the lab is my second home. As nerdy as it sounds, the hours I spent every day after school calibrating optic systems or imaging the deadly masses of tumor spheroids are my most relaxing times of day. But in all seriousness, having worked in a research institution since I was 11, I've always been less than half the age of everyone around me. My age became something I'd minimize, and it eventually became my biggest weakness. But not anymore, because I've realized that kids think differently than adults. It's not a matter of better or worse, just differently. But with the modern world's social structure, the youth perspective isn't being taken seriously in science or in general, and this needs to change. No one ever expects any groundbreaking things to come from my population, because they've just never been done before by people than, other than, quite frankly, older, middle-aged men. I mean, as far as history has supported, the revolutionary ideas to change humanity forever have all come from the same group of people. Newton, Einstein, Edison, the list goes on. Even today, the average age of a Nobel Prize winner in the sciences is 57 years old. That's still waiting more than two-thirds the human lifespan just to make our marks on society. The belief that a certain number of years is equivalent to intelligence has stunted generations. Why do we ask kids what they want to be when they grow up, when instead we should be asking, what do you want to do right now? Shouldn't we take it upon ourselves to teach kids to be proactive about their dreams? No single factor determines intelligence and capability. Not age, not race, not gender. Diverse groups of people can contribute ideas from different backgrounds, which is exactly what science needs at a time of so much progression. Rather than only having experienced people with nearly the exact same information drilled into their heads sitting around conference room tables, shouldn't we also include more people with perhaps less years, but different ideas and ages all over the spectrum? Wouldn't this be more productive? One age group in particular, kids, are quite unique. Problem solving at a younger age is entirely different from the standardized thinking of an adult. Having lived decades longer, adults have conformed to the norms of society, such that basically everyone has the same thinking. However, the youth, the youth have a spark, an entirely different element of innovation that simply cannot be replicated during adulthood. Kids don't know the laws of physics, the rules of society, or the very concept of impossibility. Like when we see this image, for instance, Immediately, most of you would think it's just a random black line. But see, that's the problem. When I asked adults this, they replied with the same unimpressed response. And some even went to the length of looking for cursive writing hidden within the loops. But even writing is a very standardized way of thinking, if you ask me. On the other hand, when I asked kids of 13 years and younger, they gave me radically different answers. Like my younger sister, my usual go-to guinea pig, said she saw a volcano, a dinosaur's head, and a dog eating a bat, 
and all these answers were produced in just five seconds. Just this simple squiggle experiment shows the worlds of difference that exist between the adult and kid mentality. Kids have the ability to see beyond reality, almost into another dimension where their innovation has no limitations. In 1963, Dr. Raymond Cattell proposed the idea of two types of intelligence. Crystallized, learned knowledge over experience and time, and fluid intelligence, utilizing novel logic to solve new problems. Whereas adults are more proficient in terms of crystallized, fluid intelligence is where kids excel. The youth possess the out-of-the-box thinking that will propel science forward. And this has endless applications when we look at technology. For example, people who have, whom have learned how to use PCs at an older age will obviously have a much harder time comprehending the mechanisms behind it. This isn't to say that they can, but rather that kids are more apt as to doing so. The same principle applies for languages. In linguistic development, it's human nature to pick up surrounding language but this capability decreases with time. The reality remains that kids who are exposed to a stimulus earlier in life will be much more proficient in that field. We live in a world where devices have taken over the roles of babysitters as kids, the curiosity of kids is encapsulated by phones and computers. Technology is revolutionizing the world and the truth is that kids have the best understanding of it. Even though most parents think phones are rotting our brains. According to my grandma, that's what her parents said about electricity. <laughs> the technology boom has put younger generations on an entirely alternative understanding of applications of artificial intelligence in advanced diagnostics and radiology or analysis of astrophysical phenomena. These are things that are just happening now with the decreasing age of exposure of babies and infants to technology. But now, here's the thing. Just acknowledging this age discrimination that exists in science isn't enough to do anything about it. What am I saying? Throw your infants into a nuclear hazard lab? Not exactly. But a love for problem solving needs to be nurtured from a younger age and this responsibility falls on adults. When I was in eighth grade, I was looking for a mentor to support me in writing a publication. So surely enough, I emailed a few professors, my research abstract, and a few days later, they all responded, extremely positively. Two even offered me positions in their graduate research labs at major universities. I was exhilarated that I would have the opportunity to work with such world-renowned scientists. I was so excited that I was sure I would have at least 20 publications and definitely win a Nobel Prize by the end of it. <laughs> but that's not what happened, not even close. When I replied, hesitantly revealing my age, that I was 13 years old at the time, none of them ever responded. Even after countless desperate follow-up emails, the opportunity was severed. All because of an unchangeable number tagged onto every human being. In situations like these, the blame falls on adults for entirely leaving a child hopeless, making them think that their ideas are irrelevant, and especially when the kid took such an initiative to reach out. Hidden under the mask of email, people were actually taking me seriously. But when reality fell upon them, they immediately cut the connection. We can't let the next generations stop taking risks because we need to fuel the next change makers that will improve the world. In the modern era of science, there's still a lot left to be done. But if we can start by breaking the age barrier, the possibilities are endless. As long as we push the next generations in the right direction, the only problem left will be to harness all the brain power. Because quite frankly, the first people on Mars are the ones to develop a vaccine for AIDS, 
won't look like these guys anymore. Thank you.